got four fantastic speakers lined up for tonight, so let's go ahead and get started. First, we have Shelly Vohr, who works full-time on Electron on GitHub, and she will be telling us a little bit about scaling automatable tasks inside the Electron system with bots. Welcome, Shelly. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to talk a little bit about today about the Electron team. So. When you think of a software engineering team, this is probably what you think of. A bunch of people writing code. However, in the context of an ecosystem like Electron, this really isn't the end of the story. We really can't do any of the things that we do without these team members, bots. All these bots are a part of our ecosystem and they each basically take care of different functions that we as humans could do, but that we couldn't necessarily do in the context of all the other things that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So for a quick example, some of the icons on the previous screen included these three bots, semantic pull requests, work in progress, and release notes clerk. As quick examples, the semantic pull requests bot basically says that if your commit or your PR title doesn't include a prefix that explains what your PR or commit does, then it won't pass the status check and you won't be able to merge it into master or whatever branch you're trying to merge it into. So as this quick example, this bot basically takes care of something that's simple, automatable, and that a human would otherwise have to do. The second example, work in progress, does something that humans also often forget to do, which is mark things as work in progress so that you know, as a developer, when you're looking at someone else's pull request, whether or not it's ready to be merged. When you mark it with whip in brackets before your PR, this bot will mark the status check in your pull request as failing, so that you know, as a developer, when you look at this, that someone's PR isn't ready, so that you won't see all the check marks and accidentally merge it before it's ready. Finally, release notes clerk is a bot we actually wrote ourselves in Electron. Actually, that Sam wrote, sorry, not to spotlight you aggressively, um, to help the Electron ecosystem with our release notes for different versions. So not to roll forward there too quickly, but to describe this in a little bit more detail, what release notes clerk essentially does is something that I'm going to talk about a little more in a second, which is help the Electron ecosystem with something that's repetitive, something that we have to do all the time, and something that's easy to forget to do, which is basically, in this case, just to add a string to your, peer, to your pull request body that indicates what the pull request in question does that an end user might potentially care about. One example of this would be, let's say that you add a feature in Electron to set a location or something. The pull request notes for that specific PR would say something like add an API to set location on startup because that's something that the end user would care about. So like I've said, how do bots help us? Why do we care about this? Bots help us improve developer workflow, enforce standard requirements, free developers time, and remove ambiguity responsibility. So what do these things mean exactly? Improve developer workflow. These make it so that our workflow is a little bit more defined in the sense that we all know exactly what it is that we're supposed to do to get something from point A to point B, like a pull request. If you don't have all your status checks passing, then you know that a pull request won't be ready to be merged. However, if you have bots that indicate all the different aspects of a, of a, uh, like a, a finished pull request that you might not necessarily think of, every single person is able to follow the same workflow. Standard requirements, same thing. Enforce a simple standard set of requirements that each PR has to pass in order to get merged into Electron Core. Free developers time is something I mentioned a little bit earlier too, which is that if you're performing the same type of repetitive task over and over and over again, on the long span of things, you're gonna end up wasting time that you could have been doing more valuable things for the ecosystem with. Finally, Remove ambiguity of responsibility. Sometimes you'll have tasks you need to do in a given ecosystem that one person can do, 
but some of the developers might not necessarily be certain who exactly is responsible for that task. So let's say that your pull request body doesn't have notes. You sometimes end up in what's called the bystander with the bystander effect, which is where you have somebody and you need to call 911 and nobody's quite sure who needs to call 911 and then no one calls 911. So what this does is basically introduce an external entity that's responsible for this, which means that you can always look and say, okay, bot does this, cool, okay. So let's look at three specific case studies in the Electron ecosystem of bots we've written ourselves and how they've helped us scale our ecosystem and operations to improve our workflow and a couple of the other things I mentioned before. The first one is a bot we wrote in March called TROP. So if you look at the code right there, what it actually does is it does backports for us. Its name is so because if you run the code on backport, that's right there, you end up with prop. There's no other real justification for that except that we thought it was a cute, clever name and we left it. So before I really get into what trop does and how it works, I'm going to talk a little bit about what backporting is. Trop basically automates backporting for us. But before you can really understand that, you sort of need to know what backporting is. Backporting is the process of taking code or fixes that's been merged into master and then basically taking those commits and putting them into whatever. So let's say right now we're maintaining 3.0 and 2.0. So 3.0 is in beta and two is stable. If we have a fix for a certain bug, that's present on all three of those release lines and we fix it in master, we need to get that commit back into 2.0 and 3.0. To do that, we backport it as a, as a different PR or a commit into the 2.0 branch and the 3.0 branch. So that's the process of backporting. Basically, I merge this fix into master and then I have to open up two new pull requests immediately to get it into the other places that it affects. So you can see in this context that it's, it follows the, the bot requirements that I mentioned earlier. It's something that it's easy to forget to do, it's repetitive, and it happens the same way every time. So backporting here, easy to forget about, time consuming, repetitive. So how does TROP help us out with this exactly? We can define a backport as a commit or series of commits that's applied to a branch. With this understanding, we can use a bot framework on GitHub to listen for merge events of the PR that I mentioned of the bug fix being introduced to master, and then immediately cherry pick these commits to copy branches, which the bot opens up. And then we can take these commits and immediately open the new PRs against the release branch. Drop did this for us by uh, taking step number one, it either listens for a merge event, and then what we do specifically is that if you add a label with the branch that it needs to go to, to the original PR, as soon as that PR is merged, TROP automatically opens up all the pull requests to the backport branches that we need. So then all the humans need to do is look at the new pull requests, approve or request, or I guess you can't really request changes to TROP PRs, can you? <laughs> no. <laughs> so. And then if you have a backport PR, you basically just approve it and then send it right into the backport branches. So it seems kind of simple, but over time, I'd say that it's probably saved us like a significant number of hours of time we'd have to spend manually opening backports. So you can see here, this is how it would work. So we tagged this pull request with the label. Sorry, I'm spotlighting you again. <laughs> we tagged this pull request with the label that said two and then three. And then as soon as that pull request got merged, this bot automatically opened up two more pull requests and then changed the labels to say that they'd been merged. Second bot, Roller. So before I really explain what this one does, I'm gonna explain the concept of sub-module vendoring as quickly as possible. So essentially, when you vendor sub-modules, you have a repository that depends on code in another repository. However, you don't wanna take all of the code in those other repositories and check it into your own repository. Instead, what you wanna do is store a commit hash that points to the other repository 
And then when the time comes that you need to build your repository, you simply go to that other repository with the hash and then download it from there. So what's the problem there? Basically, it's that when we make changes to a submodule, we need to go back and update the reference in Electron so that it pulls in whatever changes we made. This update process follows a similar process as what I've talked about before, which is that it's repetitive, kind of easy to forget about, and time consuming over a long period. We need to update this reference hash in each branch to bring in whatever new changes have come in or patches that have been applied to the submodule. This is where Roller comes in. Roller uh, basically opens up a new pull request into Electron Electron every single time that a change lands into a release branch of libchromium content. Libchromium content, for context, is chromium. Now, Electron depends on chromium and node. So every single time that we patch changes into chromium, we need to roll those changes into Electron, hence the name. So you can see a real world example there. Similarly, Rollerbot updated a libcc reference to latest, libcc being libchromium content, tells us which patches came in with that, and then we simply need to approve that and then merge. Uh, this bot also allows us, if new patches come in that supersede the old patches, it'll close the old pull request and open a new one with the latest changes. Finally, Suruwuru, which is our most recent bot. <laughs> um, this is essentially a bot that we built at a recent hack week that does end-to-end -end release pipeline automation. So in Electron, we have a somewhat complicated series of release scripts. These release scripts need to be run in a specified order every single time that we want to run a new version release of Electron from a given release branch. So what's the problem here? What we wanted, ideally, was nightly builds for each release line and master so that developers and people working on Electron could have access to whatever changes that happened in Electron on a given day without having to clone master and build for themselves. We also ideally want to be able to run more than one release at a time. Because before this, each developer working on a release had to watch their computer and could only one run release at a time since it was being done locally. We also wanted to know what releases were happening at any given time without having to ping the person who was doing the release and ask them how the release was going and at what stage the release was. Finally, this ties into four, which is removing the burden of manual work from engineers. Before this, engineers had to do this releasing themselves. They had to log into NPM, open up their GitHub creds, publish the releases to GitHub, publish releases to NPM, et cetera, et cetera. So enter Surawudu. Surawudu performs all of these steps for us. We built it such that within Slack, which is where we do all of our primary communication, you run a specified command, Surawudu boots up, asks you what version and what branch you'd like to release from. You tag it with your desired results, and then it performs these steps, which are it clones the repository, checks it out, installs, builds all the necessary um, dependencies and boots up Electron, and then makes sure you have all of your release tokens just as you do as a human, and then runs the prepare release script, and then what, no, step six is a bit jargony, and essentially what this does is that we wanted it to be such that only a few specific people could run releases for security purposes. So it'll actually ask you for a code from within our Slack workspace, and then you authenticate, and then it'll continue running the release and publish the release. And then finally, it'll clean up after itself and then let everyone in the room know that a release has been published and to where. Finally, if you'd like to make your own bots, Probot is a framework that was built that allows you to listen to GitHub events and hook into the GitHub API to be able to build bots that do almost anything. Thank you very much. If you have questions or anything else, feel free to come up afterwards.
Uh, you mean like if a part of the pipeline fails? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, like the part that's like blowing things like that. It's like yeah, so it'll abort the script and then there's a bit of cleanup that has to be done. So for example, if it got to the stage where it published the tag but didn't quite get to NPM, then we have to go back and make sure that's cleaned up. Actually, that's what I'm working on today is automating that part of it too. <laughs> that's still a work in progress. <laughs> So these bots have been written, Sudowoodoo is written in TypeScript. Um, everything else is just written in JavaScript and or JavaScript mixed with TypeScript. Hello. Oh, hello. Sorry. <laughs> Probot. Yeah, so Probot was actually built, it's an open source project. It was built by GitHub actually, but um, Probot is basically what's called a GitHub app. It's a framework. So you can use Probot to listen to any GitHub events and also access the entirety of the GitHub API. Um, you can do almost anything. So you could have a Probot um, instance that would, you can approve pull requests, you can merge pull requests, you can tag issues, you can do almost anything with it. So it's designed to be extensible. Ah, so a GitHub app runs like on GitHub itself. So you can install a GitHub app on a repository or an organization. Yep, and then you can run, if you wanna test it on any sort of a local, there's a local server instance that comes with ProBot so that you can test all of it through, so you, for example, you can, listen to all events and set up webhooks and things locally. And then once you're ready for production, you can set it up to run on some external server or something and then install it to your organization or specific repository. Um, it's a good question, actually. I think it was just based on experience and of people who were writing the bot. It was just more efficient to write it in TypeScript and would end up being more maintainable over the long term, we felt. Yeah, great question, actually. Um, we've actually ended up having to have discussions about this because, for example, like I said earlier, ProBot has the ability to merge pull requests, but we felt that the actual process of approving and merging a pull request was something that should best be left to the human. So TROP, for example, could open backport PRs, wait until all the status checks had passed and merge itself. But we felt that was a bad idea. So right now, like we left TROP specifically, that was like a very intentional choice to have TROP simply open the pull request and then the approve and merge be done by the human. So similarly, we felt that basically things that, I guess it could, it could best be said that like the areas that leave the most room for error were where we felt that it was best to be more defensive than offensive and leave them to humans. I mean, maybe at some point in the future, we could change that. But for now, we tend to leave things that basically are most open to going wrong to humans. <laughs> is basically how I would best say that one. Um, whose turn is next in terms of what? Uh, 
Yeah. So the specific number of bots that we have set up as like status checks on the bots, and, I mean, on the pull requests themselves, like typically we request that all of those be passing before we review. So for example, if it's not semantic, if there's no description in the PR body, if you haven't checked off all of our checklist items, which are like, there's a semantic pull request title or commit, um, NPM test passes, it links correctly. Um, it's not a whip. So once all those basic things, then we'll review it. That's typically how we tend to look at that. And then we have code owners set up. So depending on the pull request type you set up, that's who will be pinged for review necessarily. And then typically we take a look at it as soon as all those things are complete. Anyone else? Not all of them, most of them. Sudowoodoo is not a ProBot app because Sudowoodoo doesn't necessarily listen to GitHub events. So Sudowoodoo follows a more predefined path of scripts that need to run out of a certain order. So because of that, we didn't use Sudowoodoo, but Trop, for example, is a ProBot app, Rollers ProBot. All right, if there are any more questions, thank you so much.